May God provide this commission with the will, the insight, the vision, the sensitivity and caring to be that catalyst for truth, healing, and restorative justice in this community. What a blessed day. On June 12, 2004, over 500 people gathered in Greensboro, North Carolina to witness the swearing in of the first Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the United States. It is with great confidence in the people of Greensboro and in this citizen-led process that I charge you as Truth and Reconciliation Commissioners to carry out your work with honor for much of the quality of the work you do will shape the quality of life in our city and beyond for years to come. God bless you. I really did not fully appreciate the magnitude of the endeavor until I was standing in the room with um, all the people who came for the swearing in and as I heard different representatives from the community in Greensboro talked about their hopes and their desires for us and for the truth and for reconciliation. The installation of this commission was the culmination of nearly five years of work and planning by a group called the Greensboro Truth and Community Reconciliation Project. Initiated by survivors of a violent episode in Greensboro's past, guided by a national advisory board and the International Center for Transitional Justice, and propelled by the participation of a cross-section of Greensboro citizens called the Local Task Force, the project had crafted a selection process and a mandate for a commission independent of any external influence to examine the context, causes, sequence, and consequence of the events of November 3, 1979, and to issue a report to the Greensboro community. When I first heard about the, uh, the commission, I was excited about its potential for uh, helping our community identify and heal some of the uh, divisions that exist. And uh, I realize a lot of, uh, a lot of folks in, in different parts of our community uh, are not aware of those divisions or choose to believe they don't exist. But in my work dealing with racism and diversity and cultural conflict, uh, I see every day evidence of those divisions. On November 3, 1979, on a bright Saturday morning, a group of labor organizers assembled in Morningside Homes, a predominantly black housing project in Greensboro, for an educational conference and an anti-Klan march with the prominent slogan, Death to the Klan. A caravan of nine cars carrying Klan and American Nazi Party members drove to Greensboro to disrupt the march. As the caravan reached the housing project, words were exchanged and a confrontation ensued. The Klan and Nazis took guns from their cars and opened fire on the crowd. Five people were killed. Ten others were wounded. Police did not arrive on the scene until several minutes after the shooting stopped, but news crews and photographers captured the event on film and videotape, and the images from Greensboro were soon broadcast around the world. In the state and federal trials that followed, two all-white juries found the Klan and Nazi members not guilty of any crimes. In 1985, a civil suit filed by the relatives of those killed on November 3rd was resolved with the finding that the Greensboro Police Department and members of the Klan and Nazi organizations were jointly liable for the wrongful death of one of the March participants. With a painful collective memory of tragic violence, 
Greensboro would sometimes prefer to leave the events of November 3rd, 1979, out of the telling of the city's proud history. The Greensboro Project is drawing inspiration and guidance from a number of truth and reconciliation processes around the world, the best known of which is South Africa. You are going to be a crippled community, whether you like it or not. You are going to be a crippled community as long as you refuse to face up to your past. A press conference and open house on January 25, 2005, marked the beginning of the public phase of the Commission's work. The Commission and its staff set up an office in downtown Greensboro, took statements from individuals, facilitated conversations with relevant stakeholders, held and participated in community events, conducted a door-to-door -door campaign, met with representatives from other truth commissions, including Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and launched a website, TV show, blog, and weekly newsletter. Even as the commission set about its tasks, the need for its existence and integrity of its independence was the subject of ongoing debate in the media, the community, and at City Hall. M motion to oppose the Truth and Reconciliation Program. Okay. To not endorse, I guess. To oppose. To oppose. And that passes six to three. We will now bring this hearing to order. We thank everyone here for their willingness and openness to listen to the variety of viewpoints on traumatic events in our history. Over the course of three public hearings held in Greensboro, 54 people spoke to the Commission about the events of November 3rd, their origins and lasting impact. The reason I came to Greensboro, they put the poster out, death to the Klan, said we was hiding under rocks, we were scum, I'm not scum, I'm as good as any man walks on this earth. Gunfire, screams, gunfire, screams. Engines gunning as the shooters fled. An eerie silence. I could smell gunpowder in the air and heard the groaning of people who were dying. Uh, you don't let two groups with extreme political views from each other come together without a buffer. And the buffer would have been the police. In my opinion, yes, we should have been there. As soon as the shooting stopped and I realized that people were in injured, I searched for Caesar and I found him dead, and I immediately knew that we had been set up. After November the 3rd, the police treated us like we had committed the crimes, like we had killed the communist workers on November the 3rd. We were put on curfew. There were helicopters. There was tons of police. We were in a war zone. We were treated like prisoners in our own community. My two children saw their Auntie Sandy with a bullet between her eyes and blood streaming down her face. This scene was permanently burned into the consciousness of my little girls. And when I hear establishment apologists with glib arrogance promote the absolutely false view that I planned a shootout and then trick the police, my blood boils as my soul rages. You know, there are many people whose lives changed that day, changed to um, not trust in the system that's supposed to protect you, it's changed to, you know, a fear of many things, but the, my, my life never changed. It started that way. After 26 years, there are people who were still afraid of retaliation were speaking at, uh, at the public hearings. How intimidating, how shocking when you get right down to it. I was extremely proud of the people who did consent to speak and presenting such different views, which is what we needed, you know, and uh, without that, we wouldn't have had the balance that we we're able to come up with.
Nearly two years after taking their oaths, the seven members of the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation Commission present their final report with findings and recommendations for the city. On the morning of November 3rd, 1979, Klan and Nazi members headed for the parade starting point, intending to break the law, and came with an arsenal of weapons and heavy firearms. The heaviest burden of responsibility is on Klansmen and Nazis, who after an initial stick fight with demonstrators, returned to their cars, retrieved weapons, and fired at mostly unarmed demonstrators when the caravan's path of exit was cleared and they could have fled. We find that the Communist Workers' Party members did not seek or deserve to be killed. They did, however, underestimate the danger of taunting the Klan with provocative language and for beating on caravan cars with sticks. The primary contributor to the loss of life was the absence of police, which endangered the welfare of all involved, including residents of Morningside Homes, where the shootings took place. Nearly all commissioners believe that the police absence was the result of some intentionality on the part of at least some officers in the Greensboro Police Department. Paid police informant and Greensboro Klansman Eddie Dawson played a leadership role in bringing the Klan and Nazis into contact with the Communist Workers' Party. Despite knowledge of Dawson's actions and other intelligence that violence was likely, police made decisions to give Dawson a copy of the parade permit, not to warn demonstrators about the supremacist plans, not to be anywhere near the scene, not to accompany the caravan in a noticeable way, not to monitor the situation using hand radios, and not to stop fleeing cars after the tragedy. City officials endeavored to protect the city's image by attempting to distance Greensboro from the underlying issues that contributed to the event. The city's elected officials and managers responded to the tragedy by clamping down on citizen protests in the interest of security through tactics such as curfews, National Guard presence, public service announcements, obstruction surveillance, and intimidation of subsequent protests. The verdicts in the three trials conflicted with what seems to be a common sense assessment of wrongdoing based on the videotape resulting in a greater distrust of the justice system. A flawed system of jury selection created all white juries unrepresentative of the community, contributing to the acquittals. We found that the events of November 3, 1979 are woven through with issues of race and class. Our report discusses underlying issues including racial and economic justice, white supremacy, and the failure of the police and justice system to provide equal protection to all residents. We've worked together for two years and you know, did the public hearings, and now we have a report, which is several hundreds of pages, but I still see it only as a part of the work, in fact, a small part of the work, because there's a lot of work that needs to be done by the community, starting with uh, putting the effort to understand what really happened and to, to look at our findings and to look at our recommendations, agree, disagree, question, critique, uh, do everything that a healthy, critical community would do, uh, but, but get engaged. My greatest hope is that the west side of, the, of Greensboro and the east side of Greensboro would come together and at least talk like we had to do as commissioners because that's what happened at that table. You know, different, different parts of this city came together. We had struggles, but we still respect each other. That's the lesson, I think, to draw from this. It's not just about seven people who struggled through over a two-year period 
we are a part of a process that involves a lot of people. And that is what it's going to take to be able to try to make real the recommendations that we're putting forward in this report. I, I believe we've learned a lot from the past. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we can change the future for the better. No one uh, is ever going to be able to, uh, to heal every wound, uh, nor will uh, any, any commission anywhere be able to bring complete reconciliation. But every step toward healing and every step toward reconciliation makes uh, each community and the nation as a whole that much stronger and that much better. I'm very proud of what we've accomplished, and I'm, I'm thankful that a lot of communities around the U.S. are looking at us uh, for leadership as a model to follow.